concludes the video presentation via Zoom of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. Founded in 1951, the Roundtable hosts monthly presentations at a location near Washington, D.C., more recently at the Fort Myer Officers Club. For more information, go to www.cwrtdc.org. Okay. Uh, what I've been trying to address is uh, but little attention has been paid to the cases where he did not exercise clemency, often under circumstances uh, where, in other cases, he had uh, exercised clemency. Uh, and that's the question I'm trying to answer. Uh, why did Lincoln sometimes withhold clemency where in similar cases he'd often granted? The most famous case, of course, is that of Captain Nathaniel Gordon, the uh, slave ship captain who was sentenced to death, uh, expected, as all their slave ship captains had been in the past, to be uh, have his sentence commuted and perhaps even pardoned. But in his case, uh, Lincoln approved the death sentence. That case has been extensively covered by others, uh, most notably by Ron Sudalter's Hanging Captain Gordon. Uh, so I will make only passing reference to it here. Obviously here, in that case, there was a clear policy reason to underline that slave trading would no longer be, be tolerated by Lincoln's administration. So I'm gonna look at, at uh, three lesser known cases and see again to see if there is a pattern of behavior here. First case, well, Actually, we do have some testimony on Lincoln's uh, refusal of clemency. Uh, John Hay in his diary for uh, July 18th of 1863, uh, where he's talking about Lincoln's uh, action on court martial and military commission cases, uh, noted, quote, he was only merciless in cases where meanness or cruelty was shown, unquote. Uh, after Lincoln was assassinated, uh, John Nicolay, interviewed Judge Advocate General uh, Joseph Holt, the uh, principal military legal advisor who worked with Lincoln on these military commission and, and court martial cases. And uh, Holt told Nicolay at that time that Lincoln was uh, prompt to punish only in cases where, uh, where there were, quote, outrages against women, unquote, with the Victorian uh, circumlocution to refer to rape. Uh, Certainly, in the case of uh, Captain Gordon operating a transatlantic slave ship, involved meanness and cruelty, no doubt there. But were there other factors that might influence a decision to deny clemency? And again, I'm going to look here on three other lesser known cases uh, to seek a pattern of behavior. First one is in the case of Major John J. Key. Uh, Key was actually on commanding General Halleck's staff at the time of the incident. And uh, I couldn't find any picture of Major Key for reasons that will probably become apparent. He apparently never had a picture of taken of himself in military uniform. Uh, in any event, uh, Major Levi Turner was a judge advocate that is a military lawyer. He was actually assigned to the defenses of Washington and his, uh, his brief was to prosecute, find and prosecute cases of disloyalty in Washington. Uh, at one point, uh, Major Turner asked Major Key, uh, why after the Battle of Antietam, after we had uh, Lee retreating, why didn't we destroy Lee's army? And uh, as uh, Major Turner and Key both recounted it later, uh, Key said to Major Turner, that is not the game. The object is that neither army shall get much advantage of the other, that both will be kept in the field until they are exhausted, when we'll make a compromise and save slavery. <clears throat> Probably that was not a very wise decision by Major Key to make such a statement, particularly to an officer assigned to investigate disloyalty cases in Washington, the D.C. area. But he did. Uh, word of this got out. Uh, and uh, on September 27th, uh, 1862, uh, Lincoln notified Key that uh, he had heard of this report and ordered him to report personally to the president, along with Major Turner, to uh, investigate this particular incident. 
Uh, Key at that time admitted, yes, he had made that statement. Uh, but as Lincoln recorded the, uh, the hearing, he recorded that, quote, Major Turner says he has frequently heard Major Key converse in regard to the present troubles and has never, but Turner tried to, uh, to defend uh, Key. He had heard Key converse in regard to the present troubles and has never heard him utter a sentiment unfavorable to the maintenance of the union. He has never uttered anything which he would call disloyalty. Uh, the particular conversation involved was a private one. At that, nevertheless, President Lincoln dismissed Major Key from the army. He didn't just, just discharge him. He ordered that he be dismissed. What does that mean? Well, the uh, standard authority on American military law in the 19th century is Colonel William Winthrop, uh, and it is work military law and precedence, basically the Articles of War at that time and the Uniform Code of Military Justice to this day, uh, reportedly allow the president to dismiss a, an officer without trial in time of war. Uh, and in his uh, standard treatise on the subject, Winthrop uh, made the statement that is on the slide there. Any dismissal indeed were that resorted to because of offenses or misconduct of the officer has the moral effect of punishment in it. It affixes a reproach upon his reputation. Separation from the service is indeed ordinarily designated discharge or muster out, while the term dismissal is rather reserved for those instances which involve disgrace. So Lincoln not only uh, got key out of the army, uh, he branded him. He branded him as a, someone who was a bad officer uh, a, uh, uh, and uh, who's deserved to be uh, forcibly removed from the army. Later in November of 1862, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, after, uh, shortly, uh, well, actually, uh, uh, Key asked for reconsideration. He asked for it, actually, I think, relatively quickly after he was dismissed. Uh, the uh, request for reconsideration apparently kind of sat in Major General Halleck's in basket for a long time before it was finally sent on to the president in November. In the meantime, Key's uh, brother had been killed in action fighting for the Union. Lee then, in November, wrote back to Key, uh, refusing to reconsider his decision. Uh, this is after uh, Key's, oh, actually it was on his brother, it was, it was Key's son, had died at the Battle of Perryville fighting for the Union. On the uh, November 24th, he, Lincoln wrote back, part of the quotation is on the, the slide, but I'll uh, read the entire thing. In regard to my dismissal of yourself from the military service, Seems to me you misunderstand me. I did not charge or intend to charge you with disloyalty. It had been brought to, uh, I, had, I had been brought to fear that there was a class of officers in the army, not very inconsiderable, uh, who were playing a game not to beat the enemy when they could on some peculiar notion as to the proper way of saving the union. And when you were proved to me in, by your own presence, to have avowed yourself in favor of that game, this is in word game in quotations by Lincoln, and did not attempt to contribute the controvert the proof, I dismissed you as an example and as a warning to that supposed class. I bear you no ill will. I regret that I could not have, have the example without wounding you personally, but I can now in view, but can I now, in view of the public interest, restore you to the service by which the army would understand that I endorse and improve of that game myself. I'm really sorry for the pain the case gives you, but I do not see how consistently with duty I can change it. Now, some of the context here. Uh, first of all, if it became known that uh, Key's statement, uh, would, if it became widely known, this would obviously have an impact on both military morale and uh, the civilian population's morale. Uh, later, Lincoln actually, uh, back in uh, 1864, a couple of years later, uh, Lincoln told 
John Hay was talking about the case to Hay. He says, I dismissed Major Key for his silly, treasonable talk because I feared it was staff cock and I wanted an example. Uh, Lincoln saw to it that his decision in Key's case was uh, printed, uh, was, made, was made public. This is, a, uh, this is what was printed in the, uh, in the New York Times. Uh, it was also printed in a Western newspaper. I forget which one. I believe it was a St. Louis newspaper. So he made sure that the word got out uh, that he would not put up with this kind of uh, statement by the uh, uh, by the officers of the army. I think there's another factor here that is important, though. Uh, this all occurred three days. Uh, Key apparently made this statement three days after the emanci preliminary Emancipation Proclamation had been issued. That was issued on September 22nd. Uh, Key apparently made this statement on September 25th and was called before the president the following two days. So he made this immediately after, uh, when, when the Emancipation Proclamation was on everybody's mind. The final words of his statement, I think, have more importance than have usually been attributed to them. Remember, he says, we will wear each other's out and then we will save slavery. What does this imply? This implies that Key and other officers agreeing with him will do all they can to ensure that the, ar that the army will see that the Emancipation Proclamation fails. That's the context here. So I think that is more important than perhaps uh, that has usually been given credit. We will save slavery three days after the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. I think that's what made his reinstatement impossible for the president. There is a postscript here. here. <clears throat> uh, after the war in 1868, uh, July 18th, 1868, the War Department uh, very quietly changed Key's dismissal in its official records to discharge uh, with retroactive effect back to September of 1862. Uh, the war was over. The president had been killed. Uh, this allowed uh, the, the immediate uh, reason for the dismissal were no longer applied, and this allowed uh, Key's widow eventually to apply for a pension from the U.S. government after, uh, after he died. That's the first case. Second case involved Dr. David M. Wright of Norfolk, Virginia. If you may recall that uh, Norfolk, Virginia, was uh, during the Peninsular Campaign, well, uh, McClellan is trying to capture Richmond by marching up the Virginia Peninsula from Fort, Fortress Monroe. And during that time, the Union Army, the, particularly the garrison at Fortress Monroe, uh, crossed over to Norfolk, Virginia, captured the town. In fact, the Confederates, uh, peers were planning to withdraw from Norfolk anyway. And the, President Lincoln himself who was visiting this theater of war at the time, was active in uh, ensuring that Norfolk was captured. Uh, militarily, the most important aspect of this was that the CSS Virginia, the so-called Merrimack, had to be scuttled by its crew and removed any threat to the blockading squadron at, uh, uh, at Hampton Roads. One of the first assignments for the US colored troops in uh, 1863 uh, was to occupy Norfolk, Virginia. Now again, Norfolk, uh, uh, what happened here was that uh, a Lieutenant A.J. Sanborn, uh, he was uh, in charge at the time of Company B of the first U.S. Colored Troops. There's a, the, some of the sources say it was the second USCT, or in the first, it was obviously the very beginning of the organization of the U.S. Colored Troops. So uh, there's a, uh, not clear exactly which outfit this was, but uh, most sources say the first US colored troops. Ju uh, July 11th of 1863, uh, Lieutenant Sanborn was marching his, uh, his troops uh, toward the US Customs House in Norfolk where he, his troops were to take up their position of duty, place of duty. And uh, as he marched his, his troops plot, uh, down Main Street in Norfolk, across the street, watching uh, the uh, US colored troops proceed along the street. Uh, Dr. Wright 
who was a prominent local physician. Dr. Wright was a prominent local physician in Norfolk. Uh, he had opposed secession, but he, uh, he was a slaveholder and, uh, <coughs> and was a racist. Uh, Dr. Wright shouted across the street that Lieutenant Sanborn was, quote, a damned cowardly son of a bitch, unquote. Lieutenant Sanborn then crossed the street, drew his sword, uh, tried to arrest Wright. Uh, for, uh, Norfolk obviously was occupied territory. It was uh, under martial law. Wright then drew a revolver and shot the lieutenant twice. Uh, lieutenant Sanborn bled to death shortly thereafter, uh, after the second shot. As I said, Wright was uh, well respected by most of the, at least the white population of Norfolk. Uh, there in 1855 yellow fever epidemic. Uh, he was regarded as having unselfishly uh, worked very hard to uh, attend to the sick and dying and won him widespread respect. Nevertheless, a military was brought to trial before a military commission, basically as, a, basically as an unlawful combatant. He was killing a U.S. Army officer while holding himself out as a, as a peaceful civilian. The military commission convicted him of murder, sentenced him to hang. Uh, the only defense he offered there was that, uh, well, if he had, uh, if he had surrendered to the uh, to Sanborn, then Sanborn's troops would have killed him. Uh, uh, that uh, if he had surrendered after shooting Sanborn, rather, then Sanborn's troops would have lynched him. Uh, that was his defense. The military commission didn't uh, give much credence to that. In fact, the Provost Marshal's troops arrived at the scene very, very shortly after the incident and took, uh, took uh, custody of Dr. Wright. Almost immediately, uh, clemency petitions began to land in the White House. Uh, in fact, even before, even before the trial, there were clemency petitions sent to the White House. In fact, uh, on, uh, before the trial, uh, Lincoln himself placed a hold on any execution. He says, don't, uh, don't execute this man, continue the trial, but don't execute him uh, until you hear from me. Norfolk had a rather unusual status within the Union at that time. There was something called the, quote, restored government of Virginia. Uh, this purported to be uh, a government of uh, the loyal people of Virginia. Uh, their they only controlled, this government only controlled a few areas around the edges of the state of Virginia that uh, was, were occupied by the Union Army, uh, including Norfolk. And in fact, when Norfolk was, uh, was captured by the Union, uh, uh, Norfolk was placed under the restored government of Virginia. Uh, the governor was a governor Pierpont. He uh, initially had uh, had uh, had his capital at Wheeling in what today is West Virginia. It was the Pierpont government that gave consent to the western counties of Virginia to become the state of West Virginia. He there then moved his headquarters, his capital, to Alexandria, the house where he actually uh, was his. Virginia White House, I guess you'd call it, uh, still extant over in Alexandria, Virginia. The restored government of Virginia purported to uh, elect representatives to Congress, purported to, the well, Congress typically refused to seat them because they only represented a few few uh, thousand people. Uh, they elected uh, senators, one of them, Senator Bowden, is uh, shown here. Uh, like other loyal slave states, Norfolk, the, uh, Norfolk was excluded from the Emancipation Proclamation. It was one of the counties of Virginia excluded because it was theoretically under the control of a loyal government to, uh, to the Union. As I mentioned, uh, Lincoln placed a hold on, the, uh, uh, on any execution of uh, Dr. Wright. Uh, there was his, actually he was defended by the Senator Bowden, who's uh, uh, photograph we just saw, as well as the, uh, the lawyer in Virginia, lawyer who had been nominated as the U.S. District Attorney for Virginia, uh, Lucius Chandler. Uh, both the Senator and uh, uh, lawyer Chandler not only defended Bowden, excuse me, defended uh, Wright, they uh, led the clemency effort. They had raised, first of all, questions about the, uh, the sanity of Wright, and there was some reason for thinking he might be a little odd. Uh, 
they allowed him to have his casket in front of his jail cell in Norfolk and to work on it. Uh, he apparently built a little cupola over where his face would be after he was hanged and, and, and uh, uh, glued pictures of his wife and children in that cupola. Uh, you would think that a medical education, even back in the 1860s, he would realize that he would not be in a condition to see those photographs if his mind was sound. And so Lincoln uh, had an expert, actually, uh, uh, Secretary of State Stewart recommended the head of the uh, New York uh, State Insane Asylum to go back, go down, examine Dr. Wright. And uh, uh, his, his conclusion was that Wright was sane, he's just a weird. And so Lincoln eventually approved his execution despite the clemency position, petition. This is the uh, clemency petition that, for, I don't know how it got on executive mansion stationery, but it did. Uh, over 25 prominent union, union citizens, including past congressmen, uh, the uh, attorney general for the restored government of Virginia, uh, the state senator elect, and a past mayor of Norfolk, all petitioned for uh, clemency for Dr. Wright, but uh, Lincoln, despite these, uh, and remember uh, when the war ends, Lincoln is, intends to rely on these loyal Virginians in the process of, uh, uh, of reconstruction to bring the state back into the union. But he nevertheless ignores their petition for clemency for this man that, uh, all right, he was a racist and a slaveholder, uh, but he, he had a good reputation among the white population because of his actions during the, uh, uh, the epidemic in 1855. Lincoln denied the clemency petition and uh, uh, Wright was hanged on October 23rd, 1863. Well, refusing clemency kind of undercut the Virginia Unionists. Uh, the precedents here kind of went both ways. Uh, Wright may have shown meanness and cruelty in uh, uh, Hayes's phrase, uh, it appears this was a crime of passion, that he didn't plan this. Uh, that appears to be the case, though there's some question of how he had a pistol on him. Uh, a spur of the moment reaction, uh, not premeditated, it was just a racist outrage at seeing uh, uh, black people armed with guns and Union and Army uniforms uh, marching down the street and uh, uh, making white people leave the sidewalk. Uh, but it was a spur of the moment thing, apparently. Uh, it was pointed out that after he had shot Lieutenant Sanborn, then the Dr. Wright, being a doctor, immediately offered medical help uh, a little late. Uh, and in the past, uh, Lincoln had frequently exercised clemency in capital cases where the offense was, and I'm quoting here from a particular uh, uh, case of clemency, quote, for the offense was, quote, to some extent, the result of a sudden passion and not of premeditation. In those cases, uh, Lincoln quite often would uh, change the death penalty to some lesser penalty or even pardon the individual, but he didn't do it in this case. So what are the factors that dictated against clemency here? Well, to begin with, we have to remember the importance Lincoln attached to the success of the United States colored troops. Remember, he had written to, uh, uh, John, to uh, Andrew Johnson, then the military governor of Tennessee back in 1863, quote, the bare sight of 50,000 armed and drilled black soldiers on the banks of Mississippi would end the rebellion, unquote. An overly optimistic assessment, but uh, uh, still showed how the president felt about the importance of the success of the black troops. In his uh, letter uh, to uh, Conkling in uh, uh, for the great rally that was take place in Springfield in, in uh, uh, the fall of 1863 in his letter to uh, Conkling and, uh, on the uh, 23rd of August, 1863. He of course made the famous defense of the colored troops. He says, quote, I know, as he knows that, uh, con that part of the people that are there at the rally while well, they support the union do not support the idea of emancipation or the idea that uh, black people should be allowed to enlist in the army. I know as fully as one can know the opinions of others that some of the commanders of our armies in the field who have given us our most important successes, Grant is who he's talking about here, 
believe the emancipation policy and the use of colored troops constitute the heaviest blow yet dealt to the rebellion, and that at least one of these important successes would not have been achieved when it was but for the aid of black soldiers. On the other hand, remember here that uh, in May of 1863, uh, the Confederacy had a very different reaction to the arming of black troops. Uh, and then specifically, they had singled out white officers of black military units. Uh, the Confederate Congress passed a resolution that such individuals, if captured, white officers of black units, should be tried and executed as inciting slave rebellion. So this is the whole context of what uh, uh, what Lincoln is dealing with here. Uh, in one sense, then, the execution of Dr. Wright made clear the, uh, the policy of the Lincoln administration that violence against the U.S. colored troops and their officers will be punished severely. Might note here that, as might be expected, uh, there was a postscript after the war. Uh, Dr. Wright, as might be expected, became a martyr for the lost cause, a, uh, an essay on the incident published in the Southern Historical, uh, what, was it, what was it called, Southern Historical Review, anyway, uh, the one that Jubal Early uh, edited, gave their own, ver the uh, lost cause version of events saying, well, seeing armed U.S. colored troops jostling women and other whites off a sidewalk was just too much for any Virginia gentleman to bear without comment. And said also, the lieutenant drew his sword on an unarmed Dr. Wright. Oh, someone else handed him the pistol. He didn't have the pistol to begin with. This was the, and uh, while Wright shot Sanborn in the hand in self-defense, of course, if the lieutenant is trying to arrest him under martial law, he's certainly, he's certainly entitled to do that. It was not self-defense, but this was, like I say, the lost cause version. Wright shot Sanborn in the hand in self-defense, and somebody else, it's not clear who, fired the second fatal shot. We just don't know exactly who fired that shot. So the poor Wright was a, a martyr to the lost cause uh, after the war. The third uh, case I would like to look at where clemency was denied, the case of John Yates Beale, a young man who was, uh, he was part of the Confederate Navy, actually started out in the Confederate Army, went to the University of Virginia for one year, 1852-53, was, uh, and uh, after the 1859 raid by John Brown, he joined uh, the Virginia militia, Botts Grays. Botts Grays was later a company of the Second Virginia Infantry, uh, he was wounded in action in 1862 in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, went home to recuperate, became separated from his union and uh, his unit rather, and he eventually went to recover uh, to his brother in Union Terry in Iowa. His brother is a farmer in Iowa. He goes out there. Uh, well, as he's recovering in Iowa, uh, rumors start to circulate that, hey, this guy is a, this guy's a rebel. This guy is a Confederate uh, soldier. And at that point, he has recovered enough. He flees to Canada. Uh, in Canada, he uh, gets in contact with the Confederate Secret Service there, and he starts to develop some ideas, uh, the ideas for raiding, com com raiding Union commerce and for uh, attacking cities on the Great Lakes and for rescuing prisoners of war from Johnson Island, where uh, Confederate officers were held. Uh, he proposed raiding the commerce uh, on the Potomac River and in the Chesapeake Bay, forming a sort of a naval militia. Early in 1863, he returns, he goes back to, goes through uh, Union lines, gets back to Richmond and proposes these ideas to the uh, Confederate government. Uh, the Confederate government at that time was concerned about involving Canada, a British colony too directly in the war that this would be seen as a violation of British neutrality and therefore uh, would not be well received uh, in the South's efforts to obtain British recognition. Uh, only the second proposal, raiding Union commerce on the Potomac River and the Chesapeake was approved. In 1863, then Beale is made an acting master, uh, the lowest ranking uh, Naval officer in the Confederate Navy. Uh, uh, March 5th, 1863, uh, he organizes a uh, 
uh, what today I guess we'd call a special forces outfit. Uh, two small boats and 18 men. He starts to raid on the Potomac and, uh, and the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, he cuts a, he goes down to the Chesapeake and he cuts a, a telegraph cable near Fort Monroe. They cut off Fort Monroe. Uh, he raids light, lighthouses, uh, a lighthouse on the eastern shore of Virginia in Union controlled territory. Um, Cape Charles Light. This, this is a picture of the lighthouse that was built to replace the lighthouse that he raided, but it's the same location. Uh, he captures 300 gallons of uh, uh, of oil there that was used to light the uh, uh, light the lighthouse. Uh, in September of 1863, he captures five sloops and two fishing yawls in the Chesapeake. I know I personally did not know the difference between a sloop and a yawl, so that's why these uh, uh, illustrations here for those non nautical members of the of the group. That's the difference. A yawl has an additional sail you know, on the stern. Well, anyway, in uh, November of 1863, he is captured, uh, but he is a Confederate officer at that time. He is treated as a prisoner of war and is actually exchanged during the war in May of 1864. When he is uh, exchanged, he then goes back to Canada and uh, starts to organize. He uh, again establishes contact with Jacob Thompson, whom Jefferson Davis has sent to Canada to organize the Confederate Secret Service operations in Canada. Uh, Jacob Thompson assigns Beale uh, to a mission to try to capture the uh, United States prisoner of war camp on Johnson Island in Lake Erie. That's the uh, camp where Confederate uh, officers were kept as distinguished from enlisted personnel. He, uh, Beale gets together as a group of uh, well, I guess basically wharf rats in, in Canada, uh, not the highest quality troops, but he gathers a, a, a team together, uh, hijacks uh, the steamship Philo Parsons is sailing on uh, the uh, uh, on Lake Erie. Uh, with the Philo Parsons, they run into the steamship also sailing as a, uh, as a ferry boat on uh, uh, Lake Erie, the Island Queen. Uh, they burn the Island Queen, the passengers and crew of uh, both vessels, Union vessels, were threatened by, with, uh, uh, threatened with firearms, uh, but were put ashore without casualties before any of the attempting to raid the prisoner of war camp. Island Queen was initially uh, scuttled, then uh, the uh, Philo Parsons starts to steam toward Johnson Islands when they suddenly see uh, the only U.S. warship on the Great Lakes, the USS Michigan, uh, ahead of them, the uh, uh, Beale's crew of Canadian wharf rats uh, decide that they this wasn't really what they signed up for, and so they turn make the, make him turn the ship around. They go back to Canada and fail. Uh, the raid is broken off. In December of 1864, Beale becomes part of a group of uh, Confederate raiders who attempt to raid the Dunkirk and Buffalo Railway. This is actually a painting of one of the uh, locomotives of that railway, a uh, historical painting. It's a crew of five men who infiltrate into New, uh, upper New York State and try to uh, sabotage the railroad. There's sort of a Keystone Cops uh, flavor to their activities. They don't seem to really have a pretty good, very good idea of what they need. They don't bring the right tools. Uh, on three different occasions, they make uh, they try to uh, disrupt the railroad. On December tenth through December fifteenth, <coughs> I fail to bring the right tools or the manpower to lift the tracks. Uh, on the third attempt, on the fifteenth, one of the uh, members of the group uh, places a rail across the, uh, across the track. Uh, a a loose rail across the track. The, it causes a brief delay. The engineer sees it, stops the train, and the, the, the track is removed. Now, there was no derailment, and no one was injured. And actually, Beale's role in this was rather passive. He basically watched while somebody else placed the rail on the track, and he was not a leader of this team. I think he carried one of the tools. 
but he had the misfortune uh, to be arrested on December 16th while trying to return to Canada the next day. He was tried by military commission, uh, <coughs> again, as an unlawful combatant, unlawful belligerent. This is a uh, uh, the uh, title page of the published proceedings of the military commission. He was tried by military commission uh, between uh, 20th of uh, January, 1865 to the uh, 8th of February, 1865. Uh, his defense, there was only one witness against him. That was one of the other five members of, the, of this uh, rather inept uh, team of saboteurs who testified against him. And uh, that was it. And as I said, his role very clearly from the record of trial was relatively passive. He was there offering support just by being there, uh, not actively involved in trying to disrupt the trade. Nevertheless, he was there. He was part of the conspiracy. He was part of the group that was trying to uh, derail the train, however ineptly. Uh, his defense was they had had some information and in that a couple of Confederate generals would be were being transported on the train. Uh, I said they tried three different times. I don't know if they thought the same generals were going to be over going to be on the train three different days, but that was the defense. Uh, the military commission was not buying it and found him guilty of being an unlawful belligerent and sentenced him to hang. Then clemency efforts began almost immediately. We were organized by Orville Hickman Browning, a, an old colleague of, uh, uh, of Lincoln's in the Illinois Bar and the Illinois Republican Party. Montgomery Blair was involved in trying to uh, get clemency. Uh, Francis Blair, his son was, other quote, personal friends of the president were involved. Six U.S. senators and 21 congressmen petitioned for uh, appeal, including Thaddeus Stevens, interestingly enough. Uh, Stevens had some, uh, I'm not sure why Stevens involved, was involved himself in trying to get clemency for, uh, uh, for Beale. In general, the, uh, uh, I think the, those who were seeking clemency, uh, well, Stevens is a special case. Uh, there was little meanness or cruelty displayed in this, certainly not by uh, 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 not by Beale personally. Uh, the activities that he had invaded were usually bloodless. Nobody seems to have been killed in any of his uh, of these raids that he took part in, either on the Chesapeake or on uh, later on Lake Erie or in northern uh, New York. And uh, it seems to be a reflection kind of a Victorian romantic culture. Beale was probably seen as a dash bucking, dashing, swashbuckling hero, however misguided. Uh, something out of Winfield Scott's novel, a Rob Roy or a Robin Hood, albeit a pro-slavery uh, fighter. Uh, Stevens uh, later, if you may know, also opposed the treason prosecution of Jefferson Davis. Uh, Stevens at the end of the war was almost ready to recognize the Confederacy as an independent nation. Uh, his reasoning was that, hey, if these guys really were an independent nation, we've conquered them. And they're not protected by the U.S. Constitution. They're not U.S. citizens anymore, so we can do with them whatever we want. Uh, that was Stevens' uh, theory, and that may have played into Stevens' uh, uh, effort to get clemency for, for Beale. Lincoln delayed the execution to consult Judge Advocate General Colt, uh, Holt. Uh, Holt was having none of it. Here's a quotation from uh, Holt's reply to Lincoln. Uh, Beale fully deserves to die a felon's death. Uh, he's a spy, guerrilla, outlaw, would-be murderer of hundreds of innocent persons uh, traveling the train. Here's the context of uh, Holt's opinion. Consider uh, what Beale did in the context of what had been going on in the fall of 1864. Basically, there were increasing deliberate Confederate attacks on some on Union civilians. Starts out with the Lake Erie raid. Uh, the passenger and crew of the Philo uh, Parsons uh, and uh, uh, the other boat were, were not harmed, but they were definitely threatened with firearms. Uh, then uh, October, a uh, month later, October 19th, uh, Confederate raiders operating out of Canada raid St. Albans, Vermont. 
uh, and rob the banks there. Uh, these guys shoot three civilians. One of, the, one of them dies. They try to burn the town down. Doesn't work, but they try. Then again, another month later, uh, a Confederate raiding party tries to set fire to lower Manhattan. Again, they're rather inept. They don't know how to use the incendiary devices they've been supplied with and they don't, nobody dies and there's no serious damage, but it's clear that they were attempting to cause a major con uh, conflagration in Manhattan in a densely populated urban area. And finally, December 15th, the New York State Railway raid. I remember the charges against Beale were that he quote, attempted to destroy the lives and property of peaceable and unoffending inhabitants of New York State. In this context, it would appear, at least to me, that uh, uh, Beale's prosecution and execution would send a message to participants that participants in attacks on Northern civilians would face severe justice. Later on, one of the participants in the New York uh, uh, Manhattan raid was also caught, sentenced to death and hanged. But uh, it's in this context that Beale uh, has the misfortune to uh, to be captured and tried by military commission. And in fact, the president denied the, uh, the uh, petition and he was executed, Beale was executed in the New York Harbor on February 24th. This is a scene of, uh, I think actually of someone else is being executed, maybe Captain Gordon, but this is the gallows that was used by, uh, in New York City at the time, it was called, the prisoners called it the jerker, rather than dropping an individual through the gallows, they had a heavy weight. You can see that to the right <clears throat> here. And that uh, when the executioner cut a cord, that, that would drop and uh, jerk, <clears throat> jerk the individual up, presumably breaking his, hopefully breaking his neck immediately and uh, causing his death. Both Kennedy, who was uh, uh, executed for participation in the Manhattan incendiary raid and uh, Beale, and Captain Gordon were all executed using this device. So what's my conclusion? Well, there is a pattern here. When Lincoln required, I mean, he denied clemency in situations when he required, quote, an example in his phrase to underscore specific policies, specific important policies. In the case of General, Go uh, excuse me, Captain Gordon, of course, it would be the ending of the slave trade. Slave trade will not be, uh, uh, well, he tolerated. In the case of Key, who was simply uh, dismissed, not, uh, not executed, uh, it was important to establish firmness on the issue of emancipation, that the army was not, army officers were not going to be allowed to uh, thwart the Emancipation Proclamation uh, by inactivity or by ineptly attacking the Confederates firm that the Emancipation Proclamation was to be taken seriously by the army and by everybody else. <clears throat> in the case of Dr. Wright, support for the US colored troops in the face of Confederate threats against, particularly against their officers. And finally, in the case of uh, Beale, uh, ending Confederate attacks on civilians and civilian targets. Uh, so that's my, uh, that's my case. Well, my question is, was in, in regards to clemency, the, you know, sort of the most famous, besides the, all the private soldiers he pardoned, were the Indians, the Sioux Indians in uh, 1863. And the reason I bring it up is because now Lincoln's being criticized by you know, the way he hung 30-some Native Americans. But he pardoned a couple hundred, or over 200, as, as I recall. Uh, yeah, the guys, the guys that he that were the sentences he approved. Well, actually, you know, this is comes to him by telegram in uh, December of eighteen, uh, I think, December of eighteen sixty two, and uh, Pope telegrams him the name lists by name these three hundred. Yeah, sixty three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sixty three. Anyway, but he uh, he uh, sixty three. Anyway, it caught, he does it this by telegraph. Uh, the telegraph charge was four hundred and fourteen dollars, which was not <laughs> not cheap in uh, in the eighteen sixties. Uh, so Lincoln replies, he says, "Well, send me the records of trial," and he then says, uh, 
rather emphatically, send them by mail. And so it takes a month for all these records of trial to arrive. Uh, I've actually looked at the records of trial. They're appalling. I mean, they look like the kind of thing you would expect uh, to be uh, for a trial taking place in a frontier cabin by candlelight. Uh, literally, some of the records are lit, almost literally written on the back of an old envelope. There are different kinds of paper and everything. It, he have to, uh, Lincoln assigns two lawyers that are in the one, I think, in Department of Interior, one, I think, maybe in work for Seward. They'll go through these things. He's 300 some. And they report back to him. Basically, the ones that he approves are those who had done what today we would call war crimes. The military commission apparently had assumed every Indian was an unlawful combatant. If you were an Indian and you fired at the uh, U.S. Army, you hung. That was their approach. Uh, what Lincoln approved were the cases where the charge and a conviction was for killing a civilian or in two cases for rape. Uh, he remarks he was really surprised there were only two cases of rape because the, uh, the newspapers had been saying these Indians were going around raping every white woman they could, uh, could come across, which was all nonsense. Uh, so he only, he only uh, the Dakota Indian tribes regard these people who are executed as heroes today. They don't like to hear that they are actually war criminals. And maybe they weren't because the trials were terrible trials. They, were, they didn't have any counsel or anything of the sort. But the ones he approved were the ones who had done what today we would call war crimes. And he disapproved all those who were, had just been involved in fighting uh, the U.S. Army. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you're, they're trying to remove Lincoln's name from schools and take yeah. monuments down and so forth. And part of the justification is they use is that he hung these Indians. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, you can still say that he did that. Yeah, <laughs> it was not just because the trials were not fair. Uh, that's perfectly true if you can look at the things. But the, the ones that he were he convicted were convicted were uh, convicted of uh, of war crimes. Uh, later, actually, before the between the time of uh, Lincoln's approval and the executions, uh, a, uh, a bishop, a clergyman in Minnesota, had actually. Uh, established an alibi for one of the men who was convicted that uh, the witnesses who identified him as having killed civilians were wrong. He wasn't, uh, it was the wrong guy. So he, his sentence was then uh, reversed. Question I have is, do you have a, do you know roughly or about how many uh, clemency petitions uh, were filed and how many were uh, granted? I mean, uh, the no. examples that you gave were uh, a few, but did he give quite a few uh, grants? Uh, he did. Now, I have, I have not gone over the whole record of all his, uh, uh, I think somebody is doing research on that, going up, particularly through the work of the pardon attorney. Uh, and uh, uh, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a Justice Department at the time, but uh, uh, there were procedures for applying for clemency. Um, and uh, I, I did not want to to intrude on that individual's research uh, at all. So I'm not trying to do a statistical uh, approach. Um, I was kind of fascinated with this talk because it seemed like uh, Lincoln was taking, uh, as you so uh, incredibly uh, skillfully outlined, uh, these clemency cases on a case by case basis and, you know, deliberating vis a vis some policy thoughts and whatnot. And, and uh, then it seems to me the greatest act of clemency in American history, you know, is in fact the, uh, the Appomattox um, general pardon. Um, and uh, so I, I sort of, I'm coming away, um, and you may have just answered this a second ago with, okay, um, if this was the greatest act of clemency in American history, uh, and it is in my view actually, um, he, Lincoln was very deliberative and he had a policy um, yeah. uh, uh, rationale. And I think you said a second ago, he wasn't exactly um, against general combatants. Yeah. Uh, and so, but, so I was very curious because, you know, I think this is so important, this clemency that he did provide. And unfortunately, you know, when he was killed very shortly thereafter, it may have provided, um, uh, it may have lessened a lot of the angst that we've experienced in American history post 
the Civil War. Uh, but if Lincoln had not offered this clemency, God, I don't know what would have happened. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can off. Uh, actually, what happened at Appomattox was Grant's decision based on yeah. his understanding yes, Grant. of. of his understanding of what Lincoln had told him in, on the River Queen in their, in their last right. conference. But, but um, Lincoln did set the general uh, yeah. uh, guideline for Grant. Right. Uh, but for what Grant did, legally, he didn't pardon anybody. What he did, he said, this, these are surrendered soldiers, and rather than ho hold them in a prisoner of war camp, I will offer them parole, which was a concept very common at the time, mm -hmm. where he would offer a, a captured soldier if he would promise not to engage in hostilities until he was exchanged, there was an exchange system while wars went on at that time, until he was exchanged, uh, then uh, he would not be disturbed uh, as long as he obeyed the laws where he was, he's supposed to go home and not engage in any further hostilities on behalf of the Confederacy. Uh, some have pointed out, uh, some recent officers pointed out that some Confederate officers really abused this and said to any union, officer, you can't do anything. You can't tell me to do anything, period. So this was some, sometimes uh, extravagantly uh, uh, interpreted by some of those who had offered their parole. Most did not. Most just went home and were sick of the whole thing. Uh, they may not have liked the North. They may have hated Black people, but uh, they were not going to fight anymore in, in an organized manner. Uh, and this also prevented them, this also uh, prevented them from becoming guerrillas. Those a lot of them later did. The guerrilla you know, we're both familiar with was called the Ku Klux Klan. But uh, yeah, they were, uh, it was a military, uh, military institution. Uh, technically, it did not apply to uh, after the war was over. Uh, if you're familiar with, mil with the laws of war, pearls typically end when the war ends. Uh, and that, but that's, but Grant was, had such prestige that he put his foot down and he says, my gave my word of honor, uh, as a, as a soldier, that these people would not be interfered with if they, you know, uh, if, if, uh, if they stay, if they kept their parole, uh, he intervened in, uh, uh, Pickett's case to prevent him from being prosecuted for murder of, uh, prisoners of war. He says, look, uh, you know, they had their army, they have to have a disciplinary system. And, uh, you know, th this, these guys were deserters from their army, you know, that, mm -hmm. that's, uh, you know, too bad, but that's, that's what happened. And uh, Pickett did not kill anybody that had not, in fact, deserted from the Confederate army. So, mm -hmm. and he said Pickett was, uh, was covered by the Pearl. He was part of, uh, of the Army of Northern Virginia. And mm -hmm. uh, so he was covered by the Pearl. Uh, mm -hmm. Famous, famous uh, remark uh, on the march uh, excuse me, to Appomattox Courthouse, where Lee supposedly sees Pickett and remarks to one of his aides, I did not realize that man was still <laughs> in the army. Yeah. Yeah. I wish he yeah. had deserted a long time ago. <laughs> so there was no love lost between Pickett and Lee. Uh, but that's why uh, uh, Colonel Wir uh, Major Wirtz was hanged. He was not covered by a parole. That's why he was hanged for Andersonville because he, he had uh, he had not been covered by any, any parole. Of course, Lee, well, Lee, Lee was very instrumental in maintaining that his half of the bargain and actually set a fabulous example for uh, a, re, uh, a recommitment to the Union uh, and uh, a reconciliation, too. So I guess between Grant and Lee, there was a, you know, a kind of an understanding that we got to get this thing back together. Um, if, if you go down to Appomattox, at least this is before the pandemic, uh -oh. uh, you could, uh, they have a 19th century printing press and they print out paroles. So <laughs> I actually have a parole, a facsimile of one of those paroles. <laughs> would, would Lincoln have paroled Jefferson Davis? Well, they did, didn't they? They did, but. Uh, there was a lot of opposition to the prosecutor, Jefferson Dave, he was indicted by a uh, grand jury uh, for the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia, uh, had a unionist judge, uh, was part of this Pierpont loyal uh, Virginia government. Uh, the, the U.S. District judge uh, was more than happy to prosecute, uh, to uh, 
Jefferson Davis and the jury, they probably, but there was a, a lot of problem with that. Uh, basically the defense was simply to delay the trial, delay, delay, the delay until basically tempers cooled down. People started to think a couple of years later, well, why are we still worried about this stuff? And uh, uh, the chief justice, uh, Salmon Chase, didn't want to preside at the trial because he was supposed to. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of speculation as to why that was, uh, but uh, there was also a considerable chance if they had pressed this prosecution that the federal courts would have held that secession was lawful. Yeah, was that would have just been a terrible, uh, terrible. Yeah, that, I was my understanding that was the main reason they didn't because of what you just said. <laughs> yeah, there, there was time went on. They started to realize more and more that this thing this thing could be a can of worms. Uh, remember that up until uh, Lincoln, uh, there was only one. Oh, there were only two in the <coughs> prize cases. He just barely by a five to four decision got approval for a lot of his war measures that that he could uh, use any measures adopted, measures approved by the international law of war to suppress the rebellion. Uh, but that was a five to four decision with Tawney voting for the, uh, in the dissent, say, no, you don't have a right to do this. Uh, that Buchanan was right. Secession may be illegal, but you can't do anything about it. We were, it was a very close run thing. And uh, it could, there was some real danger that the federal courts would have held that, uh, yeah, secession is legal. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that, uh, Mr. Davis. <laughs> Let you out here. Reinstall you. And, yeah, and, Richmond, and uh, withdraw the troops. It was all, it was all a big, all a big Emily Latilla moment. Yes. Uh, never mind. <laughs> yeah. I never mind. Bad about the 700,000 people killed, but, you know, mistakes happen. But uh, in the yeah, so there, there were real problems with, uh, with the prosecution. And eventually, uh, what happened eventually was Davis was brought from, uh, he was eventually a, a released from Fortress Monroe, given over to the U.S. Marshal. I forget where he was held then. Uh, and eventually he was brought before the U.S. District Judge and he was given bail. Uh, the, I don't believe, I think the, the indictment was eventually dismissed like two years later or something. He was never formally acquitted. He was never formally uh, convicted. Just but in, this would be too much of a, a can of worms as, as people started to think about what the implications were. But in the Texas case, the Supreme Court held that uh, the act of secession was void. Yeah. Um, and then the one, there's two cases by the Supreme Court, yeah. uh, one having to do with the Texas bonds where they say that uh, secession is void and the other one having to do with things like uh, the normal operation of government where the court said for that purpose, you know, marriages and uh, yeah. things like that like were that, valid. Yeah. Texas, Texas versus like Rice, yeah. yeah. But uh, at probate of will, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, that's basically, well, what international law is today. But anyway, the uh, it's a question whether, like I say, two books have been recently written on this whole subject of his prosecution. And uh, both very good. I think on one of them, I think, uh, tax, excuse me, James Speed as to attorney general saying he was inept. I don't think that's the case. I think he had other things on his mind. He was trying to prevent uh, uh, Andrew Johnson from undercutting reconstruction, basically. Uh, but he, he had other things to worry about, just like other, it, Lincoln had other things to worry about than, than Indians. But uh, uh, they're both very good and they go into some detail. And basically the defense counsel, uh, you got to call up to him, his, you know, he would go in periodically and demand a speedy trial, knowing it couldn't be done. Mm -hmm. but then he'd shut up and he'd know that nothing was going to happen. And eventually, <clears throat> you know, he would behind the scenes encourage delay and then publicly in open court demand these rights to a speedy trial, uh, knowing it couldn't be done. For various be clear. Including the Let fact that clear. Salman Chase didn't want to preside. It, Let me clarify knew. my question, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it really wasn't about uh, Jefferson Davis in that respect. Question is, did Jefferson Davis exercise clemency while he was in office? Someone did. A, I think Mark Neely did a study of this, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think basically he found that uh, where at least where military cases were concerned, uh, that there was never a Confederate Supreme Court 
the Constitution authorized one, but no one was never appointed. There were Confederate district courts throughout the, uh, the South, but uh, there was no Confederate Supreme Court. And uh, uh, where, at least for military cases, he basically found that Davis was pretty uh, exercised clemency about as often as Lincoln did, about as often as Lincoln did. Hey, yeah, thanks for a great presentation, Buzz. Appreciate this very, very much. Sure. Um, this is more small bore. You've worked with general principles. But I was just wondering if in the military there was an automatic review process for capital punishments administered to soldiers. <laughs> uh, I, I would think it would sort of like be the drumhead thing. Uh, it varied, because, actually. I think in 18, oh boy, in 18, believe in summer of 1862, Congress passed a law saying that no death sentence by either a military a court martial or a military commission could be carried out without the approval of the president. Uh, this was the situation. This is why these uh, <coughs> these were referred to, these Indian cases were referred to to Lincoln in the first place. John Pope knew about this and said, "Oh well, I got to got to get the president's chop." He obviously expected the president just to, to just to you know send back a two word telegram reply. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead and hang him. <laughs> Uh, which did not happen, of course. But uh, then uh, that only lasted about six months because they got com you know complaints from commanders in the field saying, I can't maintain discipline. And of course, the president, uh, Lincoln, didn't want to have all every possible death sentence in the military be, uh, uh, go to him. So then uh, they pass it that corps commander, I, I think it was a corps commander or above, basically a field uh, army, uh, what today we'd call a theater commander, could approve a death sentence. Uh, Sher Sherman always, bra later bragged in his memoirs, he was always uh, uh, made sure the sentence was carried out as soon as possible so that the individual didn't have time to go, his fellows didn't have time to go to the president and ask for clemency. Then the only avenue of appeal was to go to the president and ask for executive clemency. And that's how these things ended up with, with Lincoln in that case. Uh, I have two, two quick follow-ons. Uh, well, just, just one, let me clarify sure. one other thing. This sure. is really silly. Uh, if, the, if, the, uh, if the general in the field, the, the, the theater commander, thought that the death sentence was, was, uh, was inappropriate, he couldn't disapprove it. By his own, he had to send it to the to Washington to the for the president to review. The Congress had apparently thought that the commanders in the field were going to be too lenient uh, in, in <laughs> carrying out death sentences. So they said, "Well, you can't uh, disapprove the death sentence, General. You've got to send it to Washington." So a lot of the death sentences that Lincoln disapproved were disapproved because the commander in the field had sent them to him, saying, "I think this is an unjust sentence, Mr. President. Would you please disapprove it?" It was, it was a really, I had no idea such a thing was ever in American military law, but it was in the Articles of War, I think, uh, from 1863 on. I did want to uh, mention that uh, I was struck by the fact that Beale was executed for acts against civilians, but yeah. how is that consistent with uh, Lincoln's view about Sherman's march? Sherman was, try Sherman was uh, approved and Lincoln approved acts against Southern property, property. And Sherman was, well, yeah, Sherman was, or at least he claimed he was pretty uh, hard on anybody who certainly committed rape. Uh, but he was pretty hard on people that committed crimes against Southern civilians as persons. But property, yeah, you could, yeah. I mean, if, uh, you know, Sherman's attitude was, he was very conservative law and order guy. He says, okay, if you're gonna rebel against your lawful government, Yes, young, heavily armed men will walk above you and do with whatever they want with your property. You know, this is this is the lesson you're supposed to learn from all this. And uh, yeah, uh, if you read Sherman's field special field orders, they are very well drafted, uh, fully consistent with the laws of war uh, at the time as far as respecting private property. Uh, but very early on, uh, Sherman made it very clear to everybody that uh, he had no intention of enforcing those orders as far as property was concerned. And the troops picked this up real quick as troops will do. It just struck me that, you know, after, um, there's nothing worse than a civil war, you know? Uh, and that after a war, four and a half years, 750,000 deaths, two guys 
are formally tried, convicted, and hung. That's it. No others were. And so both of these guys, Wirtz and Champ Ferguson, of course, was accused of killing uh, United States colored troops uh, in their hospital beds. He was nothing but a bushwhacker. Yeah. But um, oh, yeah. other than that, that that's, you know, we, we talk about that at the Lincoln courtroom, you know, if we ever open it again. Oh, I'd, <laughs> I'd love to go there. I never, never made it before the COVID. Yeah, love to go there. Yeah, let me know. Uh, I'll get. I'll, I'll sneak you in. Okay. Thanks. I got. I got the keys. Okay. Good. <laughs> I may contact you. My legal. I'd love to. Uh, but there actually was one other, uh, one of Worth's subordinates who was tried by military commission for crimes against prisoners of war at Andersonville. It was a non-commissioned officer. He was charged, I think, with assault. He wasn't charged with murder. He was charged with assault and uh, uh, a couple of counts of assault, as I recall. Uh, this took place, I think, about a year after the end of the war. He was sentenced to six years confinement. He was sent to Fort Pulaski down in Georgia. And I think he escaped after about, uh, about nine months. And nobody made a big effort to try to track him down. So there was one other guy convicted for mistreatment of prisoners, but uh, nobody took it too seriously by that time. On the clemency issue, wasn't the great fear of both Lee and Grant is that if they didn't have a clemency, the country would evolve into a guerrilla war such as fought in the hills of Appalachia yeah. out in Missouri. And you were talking about you know crimes of, against the laws of war and stuff. If you've ever read about or studied what went on like in Missouri, or up in Appalachia, that was no holds barred. That was guerrilla warfare like right. it was fought in World War II. Yet yep. That's kind of totally ignored in a lot of these arguments. Yes. That was really brutal, brutal fighting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, during the, uh, well, some, many would argue, and I think accurately, that there was a guerrilla war after the war. It was called the Ku Klux Klan. Was basically, those were mostly Confederate veterans. They were attacking the people who had been freed by the war, and and uh, union and Republican office holders. Uh, they were using terror as a primary means to uh, enforce their will, and uh, they got uh, kind of surreptitious backing from a lot of Democratic politicians. So, uh, yeah, I think there was a guerrilla war. The Grant administration actually broke the first Ku Klux Klan. Uh, it was revived until the early years of the twentieth uh, century. But they actually broke it, and they were able to do it through uh, uh, through civilian trials, surprisingly, uh, with juries. They were able to to do, and they were supported by the military. But it was through civilian trials. The attorney, first attorney general under Grant, uh, made this. He was a southerner back, by the way, in his background, uh, made this a major point, and uh, uh, it was the last really attempt to enforce civil rights for uh, for black people until the. Uh, uh, until the civil rights movement of the 20th century. Didn't, didn't they have the Ku Klux Klan Act? That's what Grant... Uh, That's right. Was later uh, eviscerated by the Supreme Court, yeah. Found the, the comments about the Dakota War are especially interesting because that's actually the part of the country that I'm from. Uh, my hometown is Mankato, so I grew up within just blocks of where that largest mass execution in American yeah. history took place. And it's always been fascinating to me that Lincoln personally intervened on behalf of the Dakota at a time when uh, he needed Minnesota's political support. Right. Keep in mind, Indians can't vote, yeah. but he doesn't care about that. He says, I cannot hang men for votes. Right. And by the, way, <clears throat> by the way, the gentleman who went to see him uh, one day before the Battle of Antietam was Bishop Henry Whipple of yeah. Fairbow, Minnesota. That's who the, the gentleman was. Uh, but I, I just find it a, a fascinating topic. So I was glad that you brought that into this uh, discussion. So thank you for that. To uh, say a few things in the for certain defense of the uh, settlers in Minnesota and their politicians, uh, we don't know how many people were killed by the Dakota. Uh, basically, once this uh, uprising occurred, young uh, male Dakotas just went uh, dispersed uh, without record throughout all the settlements. Uh, Michael Burlingame 
estimates that this was the large that the in the Dakota uprising the largest number of American civilians killed before 9/11. So we, there were probably you see figures like 500. Well, I, most historians look at it and say, well, we really don't know. It's probably in the thousands. There are people in isolated cabins that just disappeared, and we don't know what happened to them. I have a fam yeah. I have a family story. Uh, I'll tell it here quickly, but my great great grandmother <laughs> was actually caught up in this. She had to hide herself and her little girl, who'd be my great grandmother, in the weeds as the Dakota rode through their farm. If they'd have caught them, we wouldn't be having this conversation because yeah. I'd be that's here. Right. So, I mean, that's that's when it becomes personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. The final battle with the uh, Dakota, they had. Of course, it's mostly just uh, Minnesota militia, uh, very poorly disciplined. Uh, they did have one uh, regular, not regular, but uh, uh, Minnesota regiment of vo uh, volunteers who were disciplined or were combat veterans. <coughs> uh, they were set up there, and before the final battle, uh, that the, the uh, Dakota had planned a an ambush. It was quite a uh, out to ambush the uh, Minnesota militia when they came out of their camp. Well, it turns out these guys, uh, they knew what, well, when we're in hostile territory, you don't just sit around, you go and you, you go around and you forage or loot, and some would say. And so they took a wagon out and started to try to find food and to uh, supplement their rations. And the uh, ambushers attacked them. Well, they knew how to respond. They were combat veterans. So they pulled back and gave the warning. And uh, that's how the uh, Union Army finally won the, won the ba final battle. Forget what it was called. Uh, Battle of Wood Lake. Wood Lake, yeah. Uh, well, and actually, General Pope, um, who you mentioned, was actually uh, the person sent to Minnesota after the debacle at Second Bull Run. And so he wanted to do pretty much the same thing as Custer did later, make a name for himself as a quote-unquote <laughs> fighter. He conceived of the trials. He conceived of the execution. Mm. By the time it got to Lincoln, it was already a done deal. What Pope and his underling, uh, General Sibley, who was our governor at the time, or actually uh, had, I should say, he had been our governor. Ramsey was the yeah. governor currently. Uh, him, yeah. too, but, uh, but Sibley had been the governor. Uh, but Pope particularly was the one who came up with the, the argument uh, to hang the Indians to, to make an example. And so that was already, you know, cut and dry. The trials were over with. All Lincoln was supposed to do was yeah. rubber stamp it. Rubber stamp. It's all right. And he stopped the whole thing in its tracks until, yeah. as you described it very well, uh, appointed his uh, lawyers to look into it. Keep in mind, Lincoln was an attorney himself. So it makes perfect sense from his standpoint. But for the time, for the context uh, that he was doing all this, it's extraordinary. And these yeah. people that are tearing down Lincoln's statue in the name of the 38 plus two, uh, it's ridiculous. I, I would like that on the record. It's ridiculous. Right. I think, uh, I want to check the chronology. I think the trials had started before Pope arrived. Uh, I, th I think those had already started, but Pope, Pope was an enthusiastic booster. I mean, he oh, thought, hey, this is the best, this is a good idea, you know? So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and he got, he persuaded, he persuaded Sibley to go along with him. Oh yeah. Well, wasn't that his punishment for second Manassas? They sent him out to Minnesota. Yeah, yeah it's not like <laughs> you screw up, yeah, if you screw up uh, running the Army of the Potomac, you get sent to Missouri to uh, fight guerrillas. Uh, if, if that host has already failed, you get sent to the West to fight the Indians. Yeah, and Pope, and Pope later was sent to Missouri to try to fight guerrillas. And he tried to make a name for himself there, but the war was almost over. And he didn't do any good. But he tried. Yeah, Pope was uh, Pope and Hunter are the, probably the only two abolitionist generals in the U.S. Army at the time. Unfortunately, they were both very bad generals. What were the reasons for the Indian Revolt, uh, the Dakotas? What, uh, uh, it was go off the well, reservation? <laughs> basically the corruption of the whole Indian system. They uh, they had a treaty that they'd pull out uh, to, uh, of the rest of the state of Minnesota to their reservation along the, the river. I forget which river, what a river is that? That's Minnesota River. Minnesota River, oh. Yep. That, that's, and that's, what, that's what the state is named after. It's not the other way around. Yeah, okay. Anyway, anyway, uh, the treaty provided they were supposed to be given payments 
you know, supposed to be given supplies and payments. Well, there's a corrupt system of uh, uh, Indian traders licensed, and most of the Indians owed more money than they would get. So they, they would wait for their, uh, for their treaty money. And then suddenly the Indian trader would come and say, oh, you all, here's my books. You owe me, you know, three times what you, they're gonna pay you. So that would be taken. In fact, <laughs> ironically, as I, as, if my memory is correct, <laughs> ironically, the final precipitating thing was actually a misguided attempt by Washington to try to figure out what the treaty actually required because they had started printing greenbacks as money were supposed to be. And uh, the, the treaty said, you would receive so much, so many dollars in gold. And they're trying to figure, well, would this really be in violation of the treaty if we gave them greenbacks rather than gold? And they finally said, well, yeah, well, let's do what the treaty says and give them gold. But by that time, they were, by the time the gold arrived, the revolt was full. full yeah, thing. it arrived. They actually did send a shipment of gold, but it yeah. arrived one day too late to stop yeah. the, the fighting. The, the fighting started on the 18th of August, 1862. Yeah. It is ironic that this, the uh, precipitating factor was an ill-conceived attempt to try to make sure that they, the U.S. government abided by its treaty obligations rare, but uh, one of those ironies. Bishop Whipple uh, claimed to have extracted that promise from Lincoln before he was assassinated. Oh, maybe. Nothing was ever done to improve the Indian service. I didn't know that you had were involved in, in arms control and, and, and uh, oh. dealing with this, and I wanted to ask about what you thought about uh, space weapons and the Space Force and anti-satellite uh, weapons specifically. That's a, a very small, specific question, but that, I didn't realize that you were yeah, there, there, are, there are no uh, international treaties banning uh, weapons in outer space except those so-called weapons of mass destruction, which would be basically only nuclear weapons. Uh, and the, the ban is to station them in outer space. You're not supposed to have them in an orbit. You can have them pass through outer space, so ICBMs are okay. Huh. But uh, uh, that's the only, uh, only restriction in the 1964 uh, Outer Space Treaty. Uh, Probably they probably too late to have too much restriction. The uh, the Chinese and uh, before them the the Russians are and the French kind of a bit ahead of us uh, in this. We we, we have so much to lose in that area. I'm sorry, we discovered we have so much to lose in that area. Yeah, we they haven't deployed. The U.S. hasn't deployed any, so uh, but we've developed quite a few good ones. Um, thank you very much. Excellent talk, Buzz. I appreciate it. And of course, as a lawyer myself. Uh, I love to hear all about the, the law, the legal issues too, and the principles. So thank you very much.